If I can just ask everybody to please um, put your microphones on mute for now so we can um, begin our public hearing without any interruption. Also, um, if you can go ahead and in the chat box in the Zoom room, if you can go ahead and just sign in your name and the organization you represent, if you don't represent an organization, if you could just go ahead and um, sign in uh, your name for the sign-in sheet. Thank you. Mumble, mumble, mumble. Take your mask off. Can't understand anything you're saying. Mr. Stan yeah. Wilson? Okay, can you hear what I'm telling well, you? Well, yeah. Are you in a room full of other people or, or six feet away from any of Maybe people could hear better if you take your mask off. Unfortunately, I can't. I okay, can't do all that. right, our whatever. All right, we'll do our best. And I just ask if uh, everybody can put their microphones on mute for now so that we don't interrupt uh, others who are speaking during our public hearing. Okay, thank you everybody and welcome to the public hearing. I'm gonna go ahead and turn over the floor. Getting some feedback. I'm gonna go ahead and turn over the floor to our director, Art St. Augustine, to begin our public hearing today. Thank you so much, Janella. It is uh, 2 10 p.m. November 4th, um, 2020, and officially opening today's public hearing. First and foremost, I wanna recognize the attendance of many of our legislative members, Senator uh, Torres, Senator Tidigui, <coughs> excuse me, Senator Moylan. We also have uh, Senator Castro, Senator Marsh Titano, and also Senator Therese Trilahi. So welcome all for this afternoon. His Excellency, thank you for joining us this afternoon. So this is a continuation this afternoon of the first public hearing we had, which was on October 31st. And this is to receive public comment on the proposed COVID <clears throat> Excuse me, COVID-19 public health enforcement rules. And so in working collaboratively, as we had said last Saturday with the Guam Police Department, it became apparent that there was absent a mechanism to provide consequences for non-compliance with public health guidance and directives during this public health emergency. Our first and foremost focus is for community and personal responsibility. For us to take ownership of what we can individually and collectively do to prevent the further spread of the virus. While this is our focus, there remain the need to close the gap in the enforcement area during this public health emergency. <clears throat> Therefore, the development of rules as they are in draft form are before us for public comment and through the public hearings and submissions of comments to the email at publichealth at dphss.guam.gov they will be received and reviewed with the intent to improve and or refine the proposed rules. Mrs. Car Ms. Carrera is our public health information officer and she will be facilitating the line of speakers for today's public hearing. And we, we also committed to as those who were not able to speak at the Saturday public hearing and are on the list will be given first opportunity to speak this afternoon and then we'll add on to the speakers thereafter. So I also want to introduce or have my staff from public health introduce themselves who are here joining us this afternoon. And if we could start with our deputy directors and also environmental health representative. Well, half a day and good afternoon. My name is Terry Egan and I'm the deputy director for the Department of Public Health and Social Services. Mrs. Babago. Uh, you may need to take your mood off. Do I need to take your mood off? Thank you. Yes, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rosanna Robigal. 
I'm the Acting Chief Environmental Public Health Officer with the Division of Environmental Health. Welcome. Thank you so much, Mrs. Ramago. We also want to thank all who participated last week. And also for all of you who are here with us today, we extend our appreciation for participating today. One, to let everyone know that the minutes from the Saturday public hearing and draft enforcement rules have been posted on our website. And also, just as a reminder that anyone who would like to provide written testimony can please do so at the public at the email address publichealth at dphss.guam.gov. Thank you very much. And Ms. Ms. Guerrero or PIO, if you would please start the process of receiving public comments this afternoon. Thank you so much. And thank you to all who are here. Thank you, Director. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, we have uh, a lot more participants in today's um, public hearing, which again is a continuation from Saturday's public hearing. So um, we're going to, if I can just ask everybody to try to keep it as short as possible, three to five minutes uh, per speaker. And also, once again, I would just like to ask everybody to um, keep their microphones on mute so as not to interrupt those who are speaking and to be fair to uh, everybody who is who has the floor while they're speaking. Uh, and once again, um, if you haven't already de uh, done so, if you can also please um, uh, sign in in the chat box, uh, your name and the organization that you represent, if there is an organization that you're representing today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and begin with those who were in uh, the Saturday public hearing um, observing um, but we're not um, uh, providing oral testimony. Uh, so I'll begin with our Committee on Health uh, Chairwoman, Senator Therese Terlahi. Half a day, I'm, I'm just here to listen to the testimony. Yeah, I'm not providing any today, or not right now. Noted, thank you, Senator. Uh, I believe Senator Tello Taitagui is in the Zoom room. Um, if you would like to provide testimony, you may do so. I, I, uh, your microphone is on mute, Senator. Thank you. I'm usually always correcting everyone else <laughs> when it comes to that, trying to be diligent and turning it on. Um, at this time, Janella, if you don't mind, I, I had a, have to make a quick phone call. It, important call, but if you can come back to me, I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Sure thing, not a problem. Uh, Senator Will Castro, I know that you provided some testimony uh, on Saturday, if you would like to do so. Uh, I, I see you in the Zoom room. Thank you, Janella. Actually, I'd like to defer to uh, other members of the participating public, like I did last time, and then I'll weigh in. Noted. Thank you. Okay, and uh, now I'd like to turn over the floor to Archbishop Michael Burns. Hi, uh, Mr. Uh, San Agustin. Thanks for the opportunity. I, I listen to a lot of people and I, uh, you know, sometimes in the confessional, sometimes not. I don't reveal anybody's identity at all, but I, what I have been hearing, and I've uh, checked with a couple other priests, a lot of what I'm hearing about is anger. And I believe a lot of the anger is uh, due to the experience of these past uh, weeks and months where we find ourselves uh, kind of going from pillar to post. Um, one day we're open, one day we're not. Uh, in general, there's a, a kind of uh, a feeling of inconsistency that uh, is difficult for people. It's difficult for anybody, whether you're in the church or not in the church. It's difficult when, you, when your expectations um, are sprung on you or, uh, you know, what you were expecting, it's just hard, hard to deal with sometimes. And, um, you know, as uh, somebody in the church here is, uh, you know, we, uh, 
we'd really love for all of our people to find uh, a sense of peace or a, a, a sense of, uh, a sense of uh, consistency so that we can live our lives with kind of normal expectations. Um, and that's the main thing I, I like I say, I'm, I've been hearing it from some of the other priests. Uh, so these are real people you know, in our parishes, in our schools, in our, you know, businesses. So I'm not just speaking uh, for the church, but um, just from that, I, I just, you know, I wonder um, about the, uh, the uh, fines. And, you know, it, it'd be, Given my experience, I think it'd be helpful if, if, we, if we're going to go that direction that we have it uh, a moderate kind of something that, you know, just, you know, makes, makes you sure that, okay, maybe I don't want to do that again. But uh, again, that consistency of treatment, I think, is very important um, if we're going to go in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Archbishop Burns. Next is uh, Father Mike Chrysostomo. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good, good afternoon, Director, and to Public Health and to our Senators. I initially wasn't going to testify, I was just going to rely on Archbishop, but he kind of hit a point about we as priests also listen to our people, and a lot of times we kind of get the feedback from many of them. And though though the concept of enforcement of these rules um, is good in its inception, and I think that perhaps moving forward we can, but I think before we even get to that point, a lot of the, the discussion from our community has been um, whether or not our community is even at that point of understanding the complexity and of course the the danger of the virus. And many of them, especially when they come to church, some of them don't even want to follow the, uh, the, the protocols that we have in place. And mind you, the Archdiocese has been, has been developing these protocols and they have had these protocols in place since, since February, March. And um, we, we've even gone a step further in public health. Uh, we even have our own contact tracing team, uh, which is very helpful recently with a the, the, uh, couple of churches that have been um, identified as having um, parishioners as uh, positive, tested positive. I, I think I think many of them that that do come here to the church don't realize that many of them are asymptomatic and they're looking for a place and um, a place for healing, a place for consolation. Um, and I think if, if we continue this this path of enforcement of rules and um, the, the penalties and the fines, I think many of them would not even report such a thing anymore and the, the, rather than the deterrence it will be the the fear that's being inflicted upon our people and I, so I just want to caution that on our committee and the, the, the public health um, about that and then maybe there there could be some balance in this but I, I hope that what we do here today is truly a benefit for our people and and not being more stringent or more restrictive um, for their right to worship and their right to to be able to be in their churches so Again, it's just a, a testimony that I just want to provide that and hope, hopefully um, it's received well. Thank you. Thank you, Father Mike Chrysostomo. Next is uh, Father Paul Goffigan. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, Director Art St. Augustine and Senators. Um, and I'd like to thank the director for really uh, establishing some dialogue between the Department of Public Health and Social Services with the church, especially the Catholic Church. And we have come a long way in trying to establish our protocols, as Father Mike alluded to. Uh, the one thing that I, I still, and I've been harping on this from the very beginning, the very start of this pandemic, was that the Catholic Church does not belong in this venue where we're talking about businesses. The Catholic Church is not a business. And one thing I really want to stress is, is the danger when you start having guidelines uh, for the public um, 
you know, as, as a chair for the liturgical commission, one of the things that the, the danger is going to be is when, the, when public health begins to dictate to the church on how it should celebrate its masses, how to, you know, perform all the, you know, the different rituals. There, we, we don't have any transactions in churches. All we have are spiritual healing, spiritual, um, you know, uh, reflections, and, and especially the mass. This is what people yearn for. Uh, we in the Catholic Church especially uh, have been asking uh, not just the Department of Public Health and Social Service, but to gather with all the places of worship and to sit around the table, have a round table with the governor and the Public, public Health and Social Services to talk about, you know, and put, put work places of worship in its proper, in its proper place, not in a, in a, in a, as a business. The one thing that I do, um, you know, my, my eyebrows just raised so high when I saw the fines and, you know, the, the Catholic Church is suffering a lot financially. We are just undergoing, you know, we still haven't even come to a settlement yet with all the lawsuits. And even without the lawsuits, there are some parishes out there you know, we're, you know, uh, it, it really is very difficult as far as financial um, resources. It's very difficult for a parish to even get a thousand dollars, you know, for a month. You, you find that hard to believe, but it's true. Uh, and so my worry in that area is what is through no fault of their own, no fault of the pastors that, that you know, people just didn't do and the pastor does is very best to make sure everybody is in line with the protocols, but to really come down hard on, on people, especially the churches, um, is, is sort of a, a kind of injustice. The other injustice that I want to talk about is the very last paragraph on the, on the, on the paragraph entitled severability, where if there is um, any reason that, you know, the, the, the rules uh, were, were found to be invalid, that the, um, the application of the fines are still there. So I think you've got to really reflect on that and probably make a change in that, in that particular paragraph because as the Archbishop mentioned, there's anger going on everywhere uh, and we were still in the dark. And to, is, to live in a community such as Guam where we have that wonderful spirit of inafamalic, we, we, try, to, we try to do our best to support each other. You know, um, what do you call it? Admonish one another, but but don't let's not let's not go and start really, you know, hammering people down, and most especially in places of worship. So, my um, my main comment is that places of worship does not belong in this venue; it should belong in another roundtable um, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Father Paul Guffigan. Uh, next is Father Ron Richards. You have the floor. If, uh, if you are in the Zoom room. I don't think Father Ron is here, Crystal oh, or Janana. I, okay. Uh, and next I'll call upon uh, Senator James Moylan. Uh, thank you, Janella. Archbishop, fathers, uh, Mr. Director, uh, thank you for the public hearing. I, I appreciate that. I'm glad we're getting uh, comments, and it's it's really important so the public does understand uh, what the executive order is is trying to do, and with the uh, additional uh, requirements or penalties uh, being created. Uh, my my concern, of course, is anytime we um, bypass the AAA process. Um, it could lead to other other issues, and I'm I'm just a little worried about about that. I mean, we can do it one time, and then we can do it again. I I do understand that we're just relating this strictly to the pandemic, the health pandemic, uh, but we can at this point we can re relate just about anything to the health pandemic uh, as well. So I, I would truly rather see the uh, AAA props process uh, remain, but I understand the executive order of the governor. Uh, is coming into play. So I want to thank you, Director, for having at least the public hearing and considering the, the public's opinion uh, on this, uh, especially as uh, Father Goldfkin has mentioned. Maybe it is something we should consider uh, that uh, to accept, accept, accept the um, houses of worship uh, and allow them to uh, 
continue their, their process because uh, they want to do the things right. And it it's, will make it more difficult for, for the uh, congregation then to consider this one more added uh, measure to place upon them, and especially our, with our church at this time. Um, again, I'm, I'm just going back to this AAA process, bypassing it. It really, for me, it opens up a Pandora box, but I, I hope as the executive orders uh, do continue and possibly there are other things that need to uh, be added, uh, you know, maybe curfew, I, I'm not sure, um, but that we, I kindly ask uh, uh, Mr. Director that we continue these uh, public hearings. If we can't have it, um, ha have it at uh, Congress building here, then at least we can have it uh, through the executive office with the concurrence of, of our administrators or the governor's uh, directors. So uh, kind of consider these uh, comments, especially from our, our houses of worship and to consider that in the plan and in the draft stage at this time. Uh, thank you, thank you, Director. Thank you, Janella. You're welcome. Thank you, Senator uh, James Moreland. Next is um, Senator Mary Camacho Torres. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, it's a bit surreal that I'm here listening to this testimony at the same time that I just got a message that someone very close to me just died of COVID. Died of COVID that he, he contracted um, from exposure at work. And Archbishop, I, 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 I fully understand and support you, but what I wonder is in the in the church community, those that are active churchgoers, um, is it is it safe to say that many of them are elderly and people at risk to begin with? I mean, can we just establish that as a a, a bench line? No, it's even uh, it's among young young people as well, and it's not uh, you know. I think it's it's a frustration. You know, like uh, they understand the the, uh, the problem of the coronavirus. Is. I mean, they, the actually, the young people actually understand it stronger than some of us older folks. And so, uh, but it's I guess this this idea of consistency, I think, is the uh, the key thing I was trying to get at. Right. Uh, so, the what, what I what I um as I'm reading the proposed rules and regs, it, you know, the purpose is very clear. It it all deals with the um, protecting the public um, and promoting public health through implementation of procedures and guidances that are aimed at preventing the further spread of COVID. And and while. I, I know that that what is also occurring in in other jurisdictions that have been successful at curbing the the rise in COVID is uh, these types of measures. But but I do agree, um, and I can sympathize with the French frustration. And perhaps the middle ground here, or the understanding, is that where such fines and penalties will be imposed is where people are clearly violating. Um, the, the orders and 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 I say this with with the understanding that there are many businesses and places of of, uh, of assembly say a church I, I call that a place of assembly where guidelines are being followed where stringent protocols are being implemented and um, and enforced. So those types of places automatically would be in the clear to continue businesses and continue gatherings, whereas those that are not um, and clearly violating safety protocols would be uh, subject to violations, citations, violations, and, and fines. And I, and I think that's really the point of discussion that we have to have is where do we delineate the the establishments and, and places of gatherings and organizations that are fit to gather, fit to go, good to go, um, versus those that are violating protocols, and and maybe that's that's the middle ground and and the balance that we all seek. Um, 
because I, I, I do see that that in, in the world of where there are laws, um, fines and punishments is usually the, the remedy for, for violating those, those, those laws or, or um, restrictions. So it, 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 it isn't unreasonable to not have fines where there's violations of protocols. But I think in this case, um, we can we can also establish where there are good. For example, um, where you are you are safe to open or given the green light to open, um, you will not be fined for being open. But if you but you, if you clearly violate things while you're open, then then you know that's where the um, public health has the authority to come in and, and enforce. Um, I think Archbishop, but you know, I, I understand where we have to go. I mean, it, it's such a it's such a painful and frustrating um, situation that we're in. I think what's what's really driving all of this too is the lack of understanding. Um, people people are are frustrated because they they believe that you know they're not so convinced about the public health um, threat. And I think for many people, that's the situation. Um, but I, I certainly, I certainly would, would want to work towards that balance. For example, where, where you can establish that people are, are abiding and being extremely responsible, the clearance should be given for them. And where those are are not following protocols and clearly being reckless with public safety or threat to public safety. Those should be um, cited in violation, and and maybe it's as simple as that. But um, I, I mostly wanted to listen because I I think that you know there there is a way to incentivize people to behave or incentivize people to to you know seek a better understanding about this public health emergency. And to maybe focus us in, in on what what the emergency really is about. I, I I think that there's a disconnect there, but like I said, you know, maybe I'm I'm being very emotional at this time because I, I've been to too many funerals lately of young people who have died from COVID, and um, I soon will be helping someone close to me bury her husband, and it's just, he was fine two weeks ago. He you know. Absent COVID, he would be alive today. So it's a reality and we have to find that balance. But thank you very much. Amen, thank you, Mary. God bless you. Thank you, Senator uh, Torres. Um, Senator Tidegui, I'm not sure if um, you're ready to provide testimony. I know you mentioned that you were on a call and we could circle back to you. Um, oh, okay. I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, next is Senator Kelly Marsh Titanen. Senator Smasi, for that. You know, I, I mostly wanted to listen to the public as well, but I do have a, a couple of concerns or questions. It does seem that with all of the executive orders um, and some of the other directives that for a lot of people, um, it, you know, this is just a lot. And to try to feel like there's clarity, that they understand exactly what all the expectations are at this particular time. Um, it, it just seems that uh, somehow we need to, especially if we're looking at any sort of penalty to be working ever harder at, at providing that clarity. Uh, one of the things that I had brought up the other day was uh, when we were updating the pandemic plan or creating a pandemic plan out of the other emergency plan, there was this hierarchy or this chain of communication. And so while I appreciate that information comes from the governor's office, uh, information comes from DPHSS and, and so forth, 
Um, I'm curious where we are in the activation of this chain of command, because when we were talking about it, it was to try to get information to all corners by having all religious leaders, all uh, certain community leaders and so forth, be able to be imparting the same information. And, and I'm just not sure that we fully activated that. So perhaps for the uh, DPHSS director, he could clarify if that has been activated, if that's something that's can, being continued to look at as being activated um, in the future to help provide clarity and fuller understanding of where we're at each day? Um, so I don't know if the director would like to address that directly, but uh, just with all due respect, Senator, our, our public hearing today is really just focused on receiving public comment. Um, okay, well, I'd like to then <laughs> put in a comment that it, from the public's perspective and from an elected leader's perspective, it doesn't seem like the full <laughs> chain of command is, is being provided uh, for this information. And I thought it was a very good plan, like it made a lot of sense that everybody was going to be seeing the same thing and that we were going to be doing this across a breadth of the community. So. I, my testimony is, is that we need more of that because it does not seem that there is enough. The other is, and I'm not sure if I missed this for Saturday, but as we're looking at this, it seems to make sense to have, especially with the, the lack of full understanding of all the different directives right now, um, but to have a, a warning at the very least first before we start getting into penalties. I think perhaps for most of the community, the desire is there to be compliant. Um, and so I think a warning is, is fair first to make sure that this person has heard, they understand, they've been informed. And then if we are to consider penalties to to consider penalties after um, what is considered a, a fair number of warnings, whether it's one uh, or more. So those would be my, my two comments, uh, since some of the others were addressed already. Sidhu Asmasi. Thank you, Senator Kelly Marsh Taitu. Uh, and uh, next we'll move on to uh, Monty Mesa. Hi, good afternoon. I think I have two points here. Uh, one in regards to the fines. I think uh, uh, the fines are a little bit too much and I think that uh, issuing a, a warning is, is good. Uh, but I think the, the fines, especially at this point in time when businesses are continuing to suffer uh, and they're all trying to stay in business and, and, and try to generate as much business as possible, that uh, putting fines will uh, continue to burden the businesses. Secondly, I think that uh, the public health has done a, a good job in trying to, to uh, control the spread of the virus. And I think, you know, there's a lot of good work working towards that. But I think when you look at the businesses, and in my particular case with the shopping center, two of them, one at a GPO and the other one at Two Months Sense, and we've been following the strict protocols of what uh, public health has put out, and we've added to that, we've submitted those to public health for review and we also invited public health to come down and inspect our uh, social protocols. And, you know, we've also increased our uh, equipment and protocols to try to enhance the safety and the disinfection of our facility. 
now that I see that, okay, some businesses out there may be not following all the safety protocols that they've had put to or are following public health protocols. Yes, uh, you guys need to go out and, and, and do your work to police this to make sure that everyone is following. Now, you know, uh, I know uh, several other businesses are in the same way, continuing to uh, follow the public health rules and regulations to include enhancing some of that protocols to ensure the safety of their employees within their uh, businesses so that if it's safe for the employees, it's also safe for the customers to patronize those particular businesses. And I think we've been in this track for the last seven months. You know, our business, GPO, TSP, we've learned a lot. We've, we've uh, continued to adjust. And I'm saying, you know, we're, 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 we're complying. We're, we're also communicating with public health to ensure that we're up to date and that, you know, thank God so far, you know, we, we, we have no virus spreading with any, within our facility or within any of the retail uh, stores or with any of the restaurants. The opportunity that we're asking here is to allow uh, the restaurants to uh, have dine-in service. And this is where, even if it's at the 50% seating capacity, this will go a long way in keeping these people in the restaurants employed, but also keeping the business to remain in business. You, they can't operate. The restaurants, no restaurant in Guam, as a matter of fact, will continue to operate with a 25% revenues that they can only generate. This cannot continue. And so far, at least I visited several other restaurants and they're doing, following the procedures that public health has put through. And if there is an issue, they mitigate it quickly, they shut down, they do what it takes to um, get their businesses back on track and reopen after they cleared all their um, uh, protocols. And this is the way it's got to be. We, we, we have to live with this and continue to operate because uh, we, we can't afford another shutdown. And, and really with imposing those fines, if, if, if you know, it, it, it is the prerogative of public health to implement it and we will abide by it, but we, we are looking that we hope that it's not a shutdown mode uh, that will be implemented soon because we don't know what rules and what, or what new rules and regulations that public health would need to set up. So I, I, I hope that you guys would uh, consider, again, um, looking at some of the businesses to be reopened, like uh, not totally reopened, but at least the seating dining capacity for the restaurants need to be reviewed. I think we've done great with the retail side and I think most majority uh, of the retails I've been observing, not just at GPO or uh, two months ends, but are following the rules and regulations currently being imposed by the uh, public health. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mesa. Uh, Senator, Hello, Tidigui, are you ready to provide your testimony now? Uh, thank you so much, Janelle, and, and for um, allowing me some extra time. Uh, you know, um, I, I'm going to also provide some written testimony, too, uh, for the record. Uh, but in the meantime, there's some concerns I have with this, uh, with the rules and regs. And uh, definitely because the process that we're going through right now is kind of... Um, it's a it's little bit different. You know, this is usually done by the legislature. Um, and there, there's some questions I have with regards to this, this kind of process uh, that we're doing it here. But nonetheless, we're here today. And I do greatly appreciate everything that public health has done uh, to try and keep us safe and um, provide uh, health care for our community as well. But there is something in the, in the, the rules and regs that uh, concerns me, like most rules and regulations, 
they have a, a statement that says, um, and this is section 428106B, uh, letter I, and it says, for the first offense, such person shall be guilty of a violation punishable by, by fine not to exceed $100. So my question is, who determines if it's $50, if it's $25, if it's $10, because it says not to exceed 100. So anybody has the authority to decide what amount they wanna do, uh, wanna want uh, implement other than $100. So there's question uh, to that. And <clears throat> if you wanna be consistent, yeah. Um, of course, it was mentioned on the last meeting that we had here, who do you have to enforce these uh, rules um, at public health? Uh, right now, you, you guys are so, so tight. Um, issues with staffing, um, funding is, is a major issue. You know, so um, I don't know how, how or if you have a plan on how you're going to fund this. And that would be my first question to the director. Where's the funding coming to enforce these rules and regs? Hi, director, um, how are you? So, so, I don't know if the director would like to address yeah, this. Uh, well, you know, um, senators, I don't hear it. And it wouldn't be fair to respond to the, I did not respond to Senator Marsh Tarzino's comment, as uh, Arthur indicated, but it would definitely, um, Senator, do you wanna say whatever the questions you are, definitely those questions are, are received as a comment that we will then incorporate in our review that who is going to determine the amount of the fine, who is to enforce the rules, and, and the last is who's actually, where are we funding this through? So although it's a question, it would be taken into consideration as points that we are here to refine and improve on those. And those are, are good points as long as the one that, uh, the, as long as the line with Senator Titan, Marsh Titan, who also presented. But just to be consistent, um, you know, it would seem I'm responding to one senator but not the other. And so we'll go ahead and take all your comments, even questions, and turn them into points of consideration for the improvement and the refinement of the, the proposed rules and regs. Okay, thank you. I should have figured when Senator Marsh usually comes uh, before me with questions, she has all my questions <laughs> asked. She's very, she's very thorough when it comes to uh, questions and stuff. So probably, that um, yeah, I thank you, Senator Marsh, uh, for asking those questions too, because it's it's great concern. I have the same concerns as you uh, with re regarding funding. Um, Okay, uh, as well, it, it talks in, in section 428106. Um, it's very broad, very, very broad. It allows the Department of Public Health to implement any kind of rules and regs. When you, when you look at section B, where it says public health emergency declare, okay, any person who violates a fair to, to obey any guidance or directive issued by public health authority with respect to COVID-19 public health emergency declared in executive order 2020-03 or any extension thereof, thereof shall be punishable as follows. You can put anything you want in there. I mean, we can sit here and talk about these, these fines, but um, anything that was you put in these executive orders or you, you follow suit with, it's, it's very, very broad. And I, and I think that everybody here who's here to testify should um, at least know what you plan to put, what rules um, you plan to put into place. So that would be very helpful. So other than Senator Marsh's uh, questions, and um, that last question, I appreciate it um, to hear back from you before anything has been implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Janella, for the opportunity. And again, I appreciate the hard work that DP uh, Public Health is doing and um, to the staff there too as well. Hi, Rosanna. Thank you, Senator Tello Tidegui. Uh, next, uh, we will move on to Kathy Castro. Hi. Good afternoon. I'm just here to listen and monitor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Castro. Uh, next is Colonel Frank Flores.
Senators, Archbishop, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for hearing me today, but I really wish I didn't feel the need to address you. My name is Frank Flores, and I'm here because in early August, several employees from Island Girl Coffee were infected with COVID-19. One of those employees passed the virus onto a grandfather. That grandfather passed away on the 1st of September, and that grandfather was my dad. So I'm here today because I'm outraged. I'm really angry. The measures proposed are weak. They create a bureaucracy of checks and rechecks, and those measures are going to drain public health and Guam Police Department from critical public safety work they should be doing. And this the proposed three strike tiered policy, it's tedious. It anticipates that people will violate PCOR restrictions, that businesses will violate these restrictions. And those businesses who abide by the rules, God bless you. You should be allowed to continue to operate freely. But I'm tired of hearing about violations like in McCrouts, where inspectors and police officers have to go there four times. I'm tired of the Chamber of Commerce said penalizing and doing something about these businesses, giving harshly worded speeches. And since so many businesses are following the rules, there's clear evidence, clear evidence that following the rules is a choice. We need to make the ramifications for disobeying those, these rules severe because these violations are getting people killed. This amounts to manslaughter. If, for example, I handle explosives illegally, I cause an explosion, the debris hits and kills a woman or a child half a mile away, that's manslaughter. The same should be true for PCOR business violations. When we can link COVID-19 violations and virus spread to a death, what do we do? What do you do? The consequences for failing to obey these restrictions have killed and will continue to kill people. And business owners, again, the media and say things like, we've not seen the numbers anticipated or that these people would have died anyway. They haven't been in my shoes. They've been in my family's shoes. How about if we take your loved ones and we expose them to the same conditions my family has been exposed to these last few weeks? What, you, what are you gonna say when the virus claims somebody you care deeply about, a wife, a husband, a child. So I have a couple of suggestions. Two of these are soapbox suggestions. Please stop politicizing this issue. It's disrespectful to us who've lost loved ones. It shows a weakness of character, a desire for reelection, desire to remain in power, political advantage. It's very self-serving and with all due respect, it's inappropriate right now. The Chamber of Commerce and business community need to police their compatriots. Rallies, harsh speeches, motorcades, it was a waste of time. With all due respect, a waste of time when nobody's policing these other businesses. Instead of a three-tiered system, create a one-and-done system, a system where a business license is revoked immediately, and then four days later, a board that consists of someone from public health, the Guam Police Department, Attorney General's Office, Rev and Tax, and then include the family member who's lost someone from COVID-19 let them determine permanent revocation. These are tough times to call for courage. And this is the courage. These decisions might not allow you to get reelected, but these decisions are gonna save lives. And I saw the courage in the face of the responders who took my dad to the ER. I see it in the face of the National Guardsmen and women who are at our hotels. And I'm, I'm impacted by this personally. This affects me deeply. I'm disgusted by businesses who take the half a day pledge, use photo ops, they advertise their business, well, they still take risks with our lives. So if this goes the way traditional public hearings go, the outcome's already been negotiated by all the powers that be, and nothing we do in this forum will have any bearing on the law. And the businesses that I've mentioned are probably gonna go on to their social media accounts and they're gonna, say, they're gonna say that they didn't do anything wrong, they'll do a press release, they're gonna lie to protect themselves. So if you're wondering what I want out of all this, you know what I really want, I want my dad back. But since the good Lord says that's not happening, I'd like justice, I'd like to prevent further loss. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Colonel Flores. Next is uh, Mr. Christopher Moffness. Good afternoon, team. Um, 
I'm just uh, observing and listening to the uh, the discussion. Um, the The points are are very valid, and uh, if I have anything to add, I'll I'll perhaps uh, notify on the chat. Thank you. Noted. Thank you, Mr. Mathias. Uh, there is a, a Jen uh, in the Zoom room. I don't, and I didn't see Jen uh, sign in in the chat box, uh, but I did want to call upon you. I'm not sure if you're just here to observe or if you wanted to provide testimony. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I am just here to observe. Um, uh, my name is Jennifer Ross, and I'm with Ross Hearing Aids. And we're very, very concerned about the situation. As you know, we tend to work with primarily people of an older age group, and we want to do everything possible to um, follow the rules and um, make sure that we've protected not only our staff, but the general public as well that comes to, to us with better hearing. So um, I'm here just to observe and to hear what your plans are. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ross. All right, um, and, and before I move on, I, we did just have some people join um, in the Zoom room. If you haven't already done so, you can just go ahead and sign in in the chat box. Uh, next is Mr. Stan Wilson. Unmute, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Okay, I have several issues. Let's. I wanna start with the people that are supposedly gonna give these citations or whatever they're going to be called. Number one, are they going to have a proper ID? Are they going to have some kind of uniforms? Are they going to have some kind of training? And do they really expect they're going to go into people's homes without a court search warrant? I mean, you, you got to be kidding. There's such a thing as the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. You, I, you don't have a right to come into my home. Number two, uh, the activities that are allowed and not allowed over the last eight months have been a moving target. Um, so I would like to see what acts are an act that can cause uh, a fine to be levied against somebody. There needs to be a detailed list of violations that's update, updated as things change, because things have moved, changed from day to day for the last eight months. And not just a list published online, but put in the newspapers, both the Post and the PDN. I mean, you, you, can't, you, you can't expect the public to keep track of, oh, you can, the, the parks are closed. Oh, the parks are open. Oh, restaurants are open. Oh, no, they're closed again. Oh, it's takeout only. Oh, no, if they have outside seating. I mean, the rules change every day. You need to have whatever is a violation of these rules uh, clearly outlined and published. Um, the fact that this public hearing is being held with the suspended administrative adjud adjudication law is kind of kind of a farce. I mean, the fact is Guam has been under emergency. I use that word strongly. Uh, for about eight months and running. And, and, and the, the public, the, uh, the thing that the governor put out the other day says that th that was suspended because it would hinder or delay uh, the implementation. It indicates to me that there's a total lack of planning by the governor's office and public health. You don't think ahead. You didn't think up months ago that you might have things that you might want to do. So this is an emergency on an emergency. It, it's a, outrageous. The last public hearing, at least of what was reported in the paper, because I couldn't get on, uh, uh, there were people that talked about, what do we do uh, so that I can turn in my neighbor? So we have neighbors turning neighbors in? That sounds like something right out of the Adolf Hitler or Pol Pot playbook. I mean, this is, it's obscene to think that people are gonna 
report on, on their neighbor's behavior. I mean, you know, responsible citizens should, of course, follow certain basic parameters. I'm not sure what they are. Um, but the fact that people can be turning other neighbors or friends or, or enemies in um, is kind of ludicrous to, to speak of. And I think that there's been, you know, generally a, a lack of, of, of proper behavior, or I don't know how you want to say it, uh, for the last months, people not following the rules. But I mean, go back to the beginning. What happened weeks after this whole thing started? A huge portion of the governor's office was at a funeral in Agate or Umatic or whatever that was in the South, and nobody was wearing a mask. They were all hugging each other, and nobody was held accountable. Nobody in the governor's office, to my knowledge, was ever held accountable for that behavior. How do you expect the public to behave if 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 the leaders don't behave? The the governor's son was in a widely circulated picture of a party with 20 people, nobody wearing a mask. Are you, are you joking? I mean, come on. Oh, so the special people get to not follow the rules. Anyhow, this is crazy. If you're going to try and find people and people that are out of work and have them, you know, you, you really at least ought to have a clear set of what a violation is. And that's, that's not, never been done. I mean, I don't know what I can do and what I can't do from day to day. I guess I'm done. Nobody cares, I'm sure. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Uh, next is Miss Jackie Suzuki. Just observing. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Suzuki. Uh, I see Mr. Rob Weinberg. I'm not sure if you're here to testify. I'm just observing. Thank you. Thank you. And then I see that um, Ms. Jennifer Ross has a question. Yeah, I do. Um, yeah, Stan mentioned something about um, people are just going to come into our homes or something of that nature. Was that ever part of the plan? Or were you talking about the general public in terms of how their um, behavior in, in the general public, perhaps not wearing a mask while in a public place or something of that nature? Or, or was there some plan to, to go to people's houses? I'm sorry, were you directing that question to public health or was that to Mr. Who do I direct it to? Because Stan Wilson made the comment that um, there was, an, there was a, an idea of going into people's houses. And I was curious to whether uh, that, that's a, a plan, that's something that's been discussed. And I don't know who to address it to because I, I'm not sure who is creating this, um, this, this plan. So, I, no, okay. so Ms. Ross, with regards to your question, again, what we'll do is that is a concern that will be used in the refinement of the rules and regs. Um, it is so that we can reflect the comments made and make this rule, these rules and regs even better. So as an example, if um, anyone who's participating says that these fines are, are too steep, uh, what would be your recommendation that would you would consider as appropriate and appropriate or is it the one and done approach? And that's what we're looking at is really getting public input weighing all your thoughts, your concerns, your, and really taking them into consideration so that when penalty uh, rules and regs are put forth, they, they hopefully will reflect the different concerns that we are hearing this afternoon, but also those that were submitted and those that were received last week, Saturday on the 31st. Uh, Dr. Bellings, it's just the, the mirror image of the fence, right? Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and post her old- um, And I, I think uh, somebody's- um... Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Andrew Blakely. I think I'm saying your last name correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong, please, thank you. Mr. Andrew, Blakely, uh, you, you have the floor next if you would like to provide a 
testimony. Okay, we can um, we can circle back to you later uh, if you would still like to provide testimony. Uh, next is Ms. Gina Campos. Good afternoon, Senators and uh, Director San Augustine. Um, you know, I I'm making an effort to participate with this public hearing. I participated with another public hearing uh, recently uh, where Senator Therese Terlahi, and I wanna make sure, trying to write down everything that I wanna say so that I don't miss anything, but um, I specifically remember Senator Terlahi asking the public health epidemiologist about contact tracing and where, where, what businesses or what locations are the cause for most of the spread. And um, at that particular hearing, which was maybe about a month ago, I remember the answer being, we don't have that information yet. And in spite of not having that information put in place, businesses continue to be closed down. And so that's a really great concern of mine that we're penalizing the business community and we still haven't figured it out. The other point that I wanted to make was, you know, we can learn from those around us. COVID is not just here on Guam, it is global. We can look around outside our community and get best practices. Recently, for the last two months, there have been epidemiologists from Harvard, Stanford, and Oxford that have come out and said that closing your community, closing your economy is not the best practice, that it is not going to cure COVID. There is no cure for COVID. It's a virus. It is not going to go away. As we sit here participating in this public hearing, I am getting messages about different businesses that are closing down and selling equipment and things over there. You know, they cannot control what happens to them under the direction of this current administration. These businesses are closing down for no fault of their own. The other thing I wanna address is accountability. I choose whether I go to church or not. It is my decision. Nobody makes me go. When I go shopping for groceries, nobody forces me to leave my house. Payless is now advertising that they deliver so I don't have to leave my home. It is a personal choice. As an adult, I make that choice. I've been wondering how many people every day are dying from diabetes. How many people every day are being, are being sent to dialysis? That's a, that's a pandemic as far as I'm concerned. I don't believe the government is there to ensure my day-to-day -day safety like this. When I get in my car, I could get into an accident and I could hurt others, but I'm not forbidden from driving. I am calling for the senators that got reelected and who are still there until the end of the year to do something about this. And I'm asking public health, I think your position should be, why do we not know anything about the treatment of these patients other than the fact that they're on ventilators? There's medication that has come out for the last several months have you already gone out to secure the medication for the people of Guam? That is what public health should be doing. I am completely opposed to these penalties. Your community is already hurting. This is a public hearing. There's only a few of us on this. this. There's only a few of us in this meeting. They're part of the public. 
I want to see public health be more open and transparent about what kind of medication you're securing for these patients that are at the hospitals right now. And when people die of COVID and it's COVID related, I want to know what the other part of it is. You know why? Because it's important to the community to know there are a lot of deaths that are not just COVID. It was something else. And what's happening is people are afraid. You're instilling fear. The government is instilling fear into the community. How does that serve the community? It doesn't, in my opinion, absolutely not. And one more thing that I wanna, I, I just wanna bring up. The governor's executive order or her memorandum or whatever it is, it, you know, whatever they call it these days, it said, you know, we understand if you wanna take your kids trick or treating, you know, but do it safely. But my God, the cemeteries were closed for All Souls Day? And we're okay with that? So we can find a safe way to take our kids trick-or-treating and that's understandable. But we can't go to the cemeteries and pray or have services. And Father Paul, I agree with you. The church should not be listening to any of these executive orders. I am an adult. If I want to go to church, that is on me. So Archbishop Barnes, that was for you. Separate church and state. Let that begin immediately. We need our parishes, all of them, not just Catholic, all of them. We need all of them to be open because people need a place to go because what's going on in this community is just beyond tolerance. I do not understand why our senators aren't doing anything. The speaker has given you an invitation. Take her up on it. And let adults be adults. I'm done. <laughs> You're pissed. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Campos. Next is, uh, oh, and I think we just had uh, one additional person join us in the Zoom room. If you haven't done so, if you can kindly just sign into the chat box, your name and uh, the organization you represent, if, if there is an organization that you represent. Next, we have Jerry Tovez. Mr. Jerry Tobas, if you would like to provide testimony, you may do so. Okay, we can go back to you later. There is a TS in the Zoom room. Uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Tobas. There is a TS in the Zoom room. Um, if you would like to provide testimony, you may do so. If you can just please state your name for the record. I don't think I saw you sign into the chat box. Okay, uh, if not, Dr. Samir Ambrali. Hi, thank you, uh, respected senators, uh, director of the public health. Um, I don't have a comment about the the guidelines for the penalties, but I do would like to uh, say regarding the treatments available at the hospital, because I do work at the hospital and I'm part of various committees, is that we are using all the standard treatments that are currently available through the FDA that have been made available to us by the Department of Health and Human Services from the federal government, including the medication called remdesivir, 
uh, dexamethasone, and we are working on um, using convalescent plasma also. So we are working around the clock. And the GMH has been a phenomenal team to work with, and they have been working around the clock to create new areas of treatment of patients. Uh, there have been new tents put on, on site in the last week. So I'm not the official spokesman, but I wanted to give an update about that, since somebody brought that up. Thank you, Dr. Umbrelli. Uh, and I see that um, Andrew Blakely has uh, been in the chat box also providing some comments in there. And I uh, just wanted to give you another opportunity if you would like to provide some comment or testimony, you may do so. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. My name is Andy Blakely. I'm a nurse practitioner. I work in an emergency department uh, here locally. Uh, I, I'd like to just go on the record and say we have plenty of an anecdotal evidence, albeit a little different than our Guam community, that lockdowns don't work. We see this all over the United States. We see this in Sweden. We see case reports declining in both of these areas where they have not handed a draconian and heavy-handed lockdowns to the community populace. I read over the, the potential fines, which seem very draconian and kind of targeted towards a particular populace. As some have already said, the discussion about these fines and the nature of them needs to be further delineated. Um, groups of five people, um, it, let's just be honest, I, I, I just don't see the, I, I just don't see the implication and I don't see how you're going to enforce that um, long term. It, it, the idea that you could leverage a society and a group of people via their pocketbook and a community like Guam, which is already strapped for cash, seems a little, a little misguided at the very least. You know, I would rather this conversation been today about how we're going to avoid lockdowns in the future, what our real case numbers look like, and whether we're having real problems with regard to excess death, whether we're having problems with comorbidities, and whether we're having problems with long-term health problems from, from uh, this coronavirus and the public implementation of the plan. I have one last thing to say. The reason that coronavirus has hit Guam so hard is because of the unhealthy population here. It didn't, it didn't just come here and ravage all of us because it was some unknown disease that just killed people on a whim. It killed people that had hypertension, that were diabetics, that had obesity. Those things are endemic to Guam's culture for some reason. And I don't see the Department of Public Health um, exercising draconian measures to stop people from becoming obese or to stop people from drinking beer or stop people from eating pork. You know, where is the line? If, if you're going to draw the line here with regard to COVID and the $100 for five people, then heck, let's draw it for fiestas and short ribs. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Blakely. There is a Samsung Galaxy S7 who I don't believe has signed into the chat box. Uh, and I, I don't see that your mic is on either, but I just wanted to acknowledge you if you would like to provide testimony. Um, you can type it into the chat box uh, or as soon as you, your mic is turned on, uh, if you could just indicate so and maybe change your name so that we can call upon you. Uh, TS, I see that you've submitted some testimony in the chat box. If you wanted to provide some oral testimony, you may do so. Okay, if not, uh, I believe Senator Kelly Marsh Tyson noted that she wanted to add uh, one more thing. Yes, um, in, in reading through the draft of these uh, rules and regulations, it just seemed to me that there's a lot of liberal language and uh, it, it's just a broad sweep. And, and Senator Tidegui uh, mentioned some of this as well, but these terms um, that are on, well, the first page of it where it says these rules and regulations shall be liberally construed. And in 
section 428105 where it says DPHSS shall use every available means to prevent the transmission of COVID-19. So these are just very broad terms. I mean, every available means, you know, you've got the word every in there. So I think that these need to be further bounded uh, to use legal definitions as to what these mean or to create tiers. Um, yeah, it just seems like a, a very broad st stroke that uh, can be applied. You know, a, a lot of times with these sort of things, you, excuse me, you have uh, scales. So as has been mentioned in the testimony, um, a difference between five people congregating and, and something that's more onerous, uh, for lack of a better term right now. So I, it, it just seems that uh, there needs to be a, a lot more thought into creating really specific definitions, creating nuances. Uh, yeah, so the clarity that I had mentioned before and that others have brought up, um, that is really key. And I think with the, the messaging, um, if, if there is that more consistent way of getting it out, we all know where we're at on a daily basis. Uh, I think a lot of that would do wonders for where we want to be and need to be um, before we get to these, these other considerations of taking it a step further. So, I, I just want to bring up all of those concerns for those to really be looked at. The clarity, the chain of communication, um, having a scale for these different actions and penalties, um, having warnings so that people are truly informed. I mean, we've been hearing that people do not feel that they're informed. Um, so. Yes, I just want to make that call for a whole lot of examination and um, consideration before this moves any further. Thank you, Senator Kelly Marsh Titano. Um, so I've called upon uh, everybody that's listed in the Zoom room so far. Um, if there's anybody else that I might have missed, please feel free to go ahead and um, make a comment. Uh, you may unmute your mic if you have any uh, testimony or comment you'd like to provide. Uh, and just to note, we are uh, we started at 2.10. Uh, because we had a 10 minute late start, we will be here until 4.10 p.m. Excuse me, Janella, I have one yeah, question. Yes. You know, somebody just typed on here, Christopher Moffness, and, and I think, you know, I, I don't know who governs this particular item, that if I have a loved one that's at the hospital, I cannot go there to see that individual, even if I were willing to sign a waiver, making it my responsibility if I got sick, whether it was COVID or whatever else, and I'm wondering how much longer is that particular mandate going to be in place? Because just this week, I received calls from two individuals, close family members of mine. We have a family member that is in the hospital and they couldn't go in there at all. Um, and it causes a lot of stress and anxiety. And who implemented this and how much longer is it going to be in place? And at what point will individuals be allowed to make their, their own decision about whether or not they want to go in there and sign whatever waiver you guys come up with saying that I will take that in, into my own hands. It is my responsibility. Director? So for, for hospital uh, visits, we the the department of public health doesn't control the policies of gmh or or uh grmc 
and I, I know Dr. Samir is here and I don't know if he has the ability to um, respond to that question, um, but we have no control over GMH's policies that they implement. And, um, and if before Dr. Raleigh makes any comment, I, I just want to echo your sentiments, Ms. Mrs. Campos. I too have a relative currently in one of the hospitals and we have been advised we too cannot go and visit um, our relative. And so I share the concern uh, in terms of the question, um, our PIO, Mrs. Carrera, Ms. Carrera is correct that that is a GMH and a GRMC decision. Uh, it wasn't a directive that we issued. And just to discuss that with you, um, and I'm not sure Dr. Umbrali is a, a person to discuss it, or perhaps uh, I can raise this issue with the GMH administrator and share your concern as a result of our public hearing. Senator San Augustine, I mean, uh Director St. Augustine, I would appreciate if you would do that because I know a lot of people in the community, this has caused great anxiety for them. Their loved ones have died alone. And I think for the individual that's in there, whether they have COVID or not, it has been a tremendous, tremendous stress to the family. It, it, it is heartbreaking. If you're not the person that we should ask the question to, then maybe the senators can find out for us because I think it's unbelievable that we continue to allow that. We're in our ninth month. I mean, at this point, surely we've learned something and maybe we could figure out a way to allow family members to go in there safely or at least let them sign something that says they understand the risk and they're willing to take that upon themselves because it, it, it's incredible. I, I can't even imagine I've actually heard family, you know, people say, if I get sick, I'm not calling in. I'm not going to go in there until I know, I, you know, if I die, I die, they'll bring me in dead. And, and that's, that's painful. But that's the reason. I just hope the senators that are in this hearing and, and director, St. Augustine, we can't do anything about any of these things. God knows for those of us who try to participate with these public hearings, we are trying just to at least bring these things up, but you guys can do something. And I and appreciate I'm your comment. I'm praying that you guys start doing it, okay? And we appreciate your Is comment, Mr. Campus, and I will bring it up with the uh, GMH administrator. Thank you. I'm not sure Dr. Umbrella wanted a further comment, but I, I will bring it up with the GMH administrator and share your concern. Yeah, can I make a comment, a uh, couple of comments rather? So yeah, I mean, we all, we all are worried about families and caregivers not able to visit patients in the hospital because we understand that it's a crucial support system that we need to incorporate. But during these hard times, the, the risk that is real in, because of the high community transmission, the, I think the, the administration is taking these efforts to protect the patients in the hospital as well as the, the, the staff members. And one way I think we can see that these policies will be reversed is when we have low, low community transmission, our numbers come down, and that'll be happening through the various guidelines that we have been advised about. Now, the, the flip side to it is, you know, we also, I mean, I'm an oncologist and I have patients who, who need certain procedures, uh, which are usually day procedures at the hospital, and they are, they're also scared to go into the hospital because, you know, they are worried about getting COVID. So both ways, you know, we, we are seeing there is, there is disproportionate uh, affection of patients, not only in the hospital, but all outside the hospital who are scared of, you know, getting medical care, even in, even in outpatient clinics. So in the, the, the way we see this, you know, improve is to we can, we, a way we can reduce the transmission in our community. Now, coming back to the, 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 the topic for today's discussion about the penalties, and I've had a chance to look at it now. Uh, I think, you know, if you look at our, our cases, um, I feel that the, the penalties are going to disproportionately affect the, the, so, the, the socioeconomic class of patients that possibly have no income or have very little income to pay these penalties. And the, the second and third incidences when you are thinking about uh, possibly imprisonment, I think that will, that would, be really uh, a sad outcome for these uh, populations. So I would, I would consider we we try to look for alternative 
scenarios of you know encouraging social distancing rather than penalizing somebody for having gatherings um, you know there is you know we are running possibly running short of ideas because of these high numbers but i feel there is going to be a disparity when you try to apply these penalties i have patients who can't afford 20 40 dollars of copay for medical care and uh, if such patients are you know put at risk of more penalties and possible jail time it's uh, it's really unfortunate Thank you, Dr. Samir and, and uh, Ms. Campos. Is there anybody else that would like to uh, provide any testimony or make a comment that I may have missed? Uh, if not, I'd like to just use this opportunity to uh, just inform everybody that um, if you don't want to provide oral testimony, you may also provide written testimony through our email address. That's publichealth at dphss.guam.gov. Uh, we are accepting written testimony until 4 o'clock, well, 4.10 p.m. today. Um, again, that's publichealth at dphss guam.gov and it's in the chat box as well we've also posted the draft rules uh, draft enforcement rules on our website the link is also in our um, chat box it might be a little difficult to find because there was a lot of comments in there but it is in our chat box um, as well as the minutes from the Saturday public hearing um, and then the minutes from today's public hearing will also be posted on our website as well as soon as that is uh, available. Uh, so for now, um, I guess we'll just wait until uh, if there's more testimony from uh, anybody in the Zoom room right now, if you would like to do so. Um, but we are here until 4.10 p.m. So if you would like to provide further testimony, you may do so. Um, you can just unmute yourselves. Hi, Janella. This is uh, Monty Mesa again. I just wanted to, I guess, get an update. I understand, you know, that you guys are coming up with potential uh, fines, but are there any more new rules or regulations that you guys are looking at to implement that has not already been implemented? And what would be the difference on that be? Thank or you, is Go ahead. Go ahead, sorry. Or, or the bottom line here is that you guys, to keep people in place is to find them or, or, or have a financial uh, penalty for people who are not abiding by the rules and regulations that's already been set. And I think most of the things that you guys have put out for businesses to follow are being followed and yes if some businesses are not following those then that's on them and 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 they should be held accountable but i i still felt to see where if there's anything new in the rules and regulation that needs to be updated because you know we've been following all the proper protocols that have been suggested with our industry and have included that with uh, some of the things that already uh, public health has put out and we've strengthened that. And unless there's anything else out of CDC or uh, uh, from uh, the World Health Organization that's uh, wanting to uh, update the current rules and regulations for us to be able to continue to live with this virus around you know what 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 are the rules so we know up front what what is not being followed because 
I, I, you know, as I listen to all the other comments, I'm, you know, we're back to again uh, certain individuals not following the law, so to speak. And yes, there's citations for that if you are speeding. So there's rules and regulations set for that. Now, for this particular instance, you know, we all support the effort that we're all trying to do to minimize the spread and, and, and not get people to be sick. And we understand that, you know, a large portion of the population is not infected. Only a very 10% 10, 10 at, at best. And, and we're sort of focusing on all the other law abiding citizens and the ones that are not abiding are, are, are really what you want to set up this rules and regulation or this penalties. So is there anything else new that we need to know that we need to be aware of so that, you know, we don't violate what is the right thing to do? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mesa, for your uh, questions and your comments. Uh, we're, we are taking note of them. And, and again, as the director had mentioned, um, uh, we're receiving your questions as comments and they are being recorded officially for the record. Um, and just to be fair, we, we, we aren't uh, particularly asked or answering uh, questions as others have also asked uh, questions and but we are taking them uh, for the record and will be uh, included in all the comments that were provided today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Janella Telotidiqui here, if I may. Yes, Senator, go ahead. Um, after this is done, uh, the public hearing of both days, um, will there be a time in which we can submit written testimony that you'll receive before deliberating on um, how you're going to move forward? Well, yeah. What's the procedure after this hearing? Okay, so I, I, uh, I did answer this question in the first public hearing. So, so to be fair, I will answer this question. Um, we, uh, so after today's public hearing uh, and after receiving all the um, written testimony, um, we will refine the um, draft enforcement rules. Um, we will then send it to the governor for her concurrence. Um, and uh, once it's adopted, uh, we will provide copies of it to um, all three branches of government. Of government. Sorry. Janella, is there any time frame? Because uh, as we mentioned, um, some of us might be providing written testimony. Are you going to uh, leave a window for those, anybody who wants to submit written testimony within the next four days or five days before you go into deliberations? So, so, so written testimony is up until 4, 10 p.m. today. Okay, today. Okay. Yes. Thank you, yes. Janella. Thank you. You're welcome, Senator. Uh, we do have one individual who just entered the Zoom room uh, just about a minute ago by the name of S. Benson. If you would like to provide testimony, you may do so. We just ask that you please state your name for the record. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just uh, trying to uh, listen about the uh, the hearing. Thank you. I'm Spencer Hyman from uh, Senator Clan Rachel Office. Thank you. I'm just uh, trying to listen what the uh, meetings is all about. Thank you. Okay. Noted, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, if you may do so, if you can just go ahead and sign into the um, chat box. Oh, okay. Your name and the office you represent. Thank you. Thank you. I I, I, I see your comment, Senator uh, Kelly Marsh. I forgot to mention that that is part of the process. 
there is a legal review as part of the process. Uh, Senator Marsh noted, uh, for the record, I request that the draft rules be reviewed by the AG before being considered final. Uh, there is legal review um, as part of the process. And I forgot to mention that. Okay. I so that, it's good to hear that there is legal process. I mean, there were uh, questions brought up uh, during the hearing about the legality of certain things. Is this um, the DPHSS private counsel or is this the AG? Um, I'm, I, I have to, um, I think Director St. Augustine might have stepped out for uh, a restroom break, but I have to follow up to find out if this is the AG or if this is uh, the DPHSS Council. I'm not sure which one. I'll have to find out for sure which one. Okay, I, so it, yeah, if it isn't the AG, I mean, my request would be that the AG, um, given his authority, um, be the one to opine um, even after the legal counsel of DPHSS. Okay, noted. And we'll definitely take your comments uh, and your suggestion for the record. It's just Masi. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I was on mute when I when I said that uh, we will take your suggestion for the record. I'm not sure if I was on mute when I said that. Thank you. Situs Masi.
Okay, Hafida, everybody, uh, thank you all for your patience and sitting through uh, our public hearing with us, especially those who stuck with us uh, through the um, entire nearly two hours. Um, and um, it's now 4.02 p.m. Uh, we're getting close to 4.10 p.m. I just want to remind everybody again that um, our draft enforcement rules are posted on our website. That's dphss.guam.gov. Um, and uh, there is about eight minutes left. If you want to submit your written testimony, you still may do so. The um, email address is publichealth at dphss.guam.gov. I just want to thank everybody again today for um, participating in the public hearing and for providing all of their testimony uh, today. Uh, we will take into consideration everybody's testimony uh, for uh, the process of refining the public health uh, draft enforcement rules. Um, I just want to go ahead and turn over the floor to um, Director Arthur St. Augustine if he wants to give some closing remarks before um, we adjourn today's public hearing. Thank you, Janella, for that. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank all those who attended this afternoon's public hearing. It's an opportunity for you to provide comments, and definitely that's what happened this afternoon. We received comments from various perspectives, and we respect the varying perspectives that were provided this afternoon. And we will take your comments that were orally provided. We have comments that I understand are also going to be received through our website or our email address. We will take all those comments and weigh them including the need for education, more education, public awareness, perhaps giving a warning versus the first uh, penalty being assessed, and even looking at the amounts. There were so many different comments, concerns, and points brought out this afternoon. And so we really want to take some time to review those and see what we the most balanced way that we can with the intent of always looking at first and foremost, educating our public about personal responsibility and response to COVID-19, that for the few, that don't take that responsibility as serious as many of us do, that the law enforcement would have a mechanism to respond to those situations and to provide greater clarity and definition in terms of what the rules and regs would look like at the end. So I want to thank everyone again for your thoughts and your sharing this afternoon. I know the hearing doesn't end for six minutes, but I do want to thank you all and uh, Mrs. Rosanna Robigo who is the Chief Administrator for Environmental Health, will remain till 410, as well as Janella, to take any final comments or share your thoughts before we officially close this afternoon's public hearing. But I want to thank all the senators who joined us, and as well as our community, His Excellency Archbishop, and all the members of the clergy, and just really the community for coming out and sharing your thoughts and your concerns. Season was massive. Ms. Uh, Robigo, I don't know if you want to um, provide any comment or closing remarks as well. Uh, no, I'd just like to thank everybody for being present at today's hearing. I know this is the last day of our hearing, um, but we have listened to all your concerns. Um, our division is the one primarily tasked to go out and enforce the governor's executive orders, the public health guidance documents, and. I can certainly understand and appreciate some of the comments being made about how, you know, things seem to change from week to week. Um, it's been a real challenging time for all of us, um, both for members of the public, for us here at Public Health, I'm sure even the legislative body trying to come up with ways on how we can be effective and work together. Um, and I just like to say it really truly takes a whole community effort at uh, being compliant because it's never fun to go out and have to um, impose these penalties or uh, site facilities or close businesses down. That's never our intent. Our intent is primarily to always work with the community and have a strong education campaign. So I just like to thank everyone again for coming out and presenting uh, their testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robigo. Uh, again, I just want to remind everybody that our uh, draft rules has been posted to our website. Um, 
and we are going to be reviewing all of the um, oral and written testimony that's been submitted. The um, minutes uh, from the Saturday public uh, hearing has also been posted to our website. So if you want to review the uh, oral testimony that was provided by the community at the Saturday public hearing, that's also available on our website. And then the oral testimony that was provided today will also be posted on our website. Once we've been able to go through all of that, uh, we'll post that online as well. Uh, we have about three minutes left till 4.10. Um, so uh, I don't know if that's enough time, if there's anybody who would like to give any other remarks, uh, but just on behalf of the Department of Public Health and Social Services, we just wanna thank everybody for participating. Uh, this is an important process of um, you know forming these uh, rules and regulations. So we are grateful to everybody who participated and we are um, going to take everybody's comments and suggestions into consideration. Okay, I think uh, we're just about um, ready to close, uh, conclude our meeting. Uh, the uh, Again, just uh, to let you know, the draft rules, enforcement rules is available on our website. Um, also, this uh, public hearing was live streamed on our um, Facebook page and a recording of it will also be available on our YouTube page as well. Thank you everybody and uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Please be safe out there. Sizuzmasi. Thank you.